When you're growing your brokerage, how much effort do you put into looking into the culture of a firm you might be interested in merging with or acquiring? How much effort do you put into understanding the leaders of those companies? Um, well, for United Real Estate, it is a lot. Um, and today I was speaking with the CEO of United Real Estate Holdings, Dan Duffy, and we went into specifics about how they perform their mergers and acquisitions, how their focus right now is on organic growth, and kind of the growth levers that they like to pull based on what the market looks like. And he has some really great information for brokers out there who are really interested in growing through M&A or organic growth and, and really focusing on that growth in the coming years. So enjoy the podcast. Dan, welcome to the Real Trending Podcast. Hey, Tracy, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing well, doing Good. well. Well, congratulations on being a Real Trends game changer. And for those of you listening, uh, it is companies that grew, picked from the Real Trends verified brokerage rankings that grew the most by transaction side percentage. And I know we've talked before, a lot of it has been mergers and acquisitions for the first part of that, um, and then some, some organic growth for the later part. But I want to kind of have you elaborate first on the key acquisitions that you made um, during those years and how they have impacted your overall growth strategy. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people look at the um, look at the KPIs. You know, how many agents mm -hmm. do you bring on board, or how many uh, transactions? We actually look at you know who are the thought leaders that came along with those transactions, and you know so. All of them uh, to a to a deal had substantial thought leadership that we benefited from now and continue to benefit from. So I would say the the, the first real transformative set of, of transactions was uh, virtual properties real estate in Atlanta, Georgia, which is now I believe the number one market share in Georgia, number one market share in Atlanta, has grown from thirty six hundred agents to over five thousand agents since coming on board. Uh, Steve Wagner and Jamie Mertz, uh, and then Steve's mom, who's since retired. Uh, mm -hmm. Great people. That was transformative, for sure. And then there was another transaction um, early, right out of the gate in December of 2020, which was um, Benchmark in Nashville. And that's obviously with Philip Cantrell, well known to your audience and to you. Yes. Um, Eric Pearson with Pearson Smith. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have Sonny and Ray down in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, you've got the group here with Platinum Real Estate in Kansas City. Um, we've, we've just been blessed with, and there's, there's more, but we've been blessed with just some incredible additions to the team and then obviously a, quite a bit of scale. Yeah, I uh, ran into Sonny at the Florida Realtors Conference and he, he had on some crazy outfit. Um, <laughs> it was great talking to him, so... Yeah. Yeah, he was he was recently, I don't know if he volunteered or was voluntold, but I he's been volunteered. We we identify the same thing you just mentioned. Yeah. Um he is most of the CEOs of the companies have dual titles mm -hmm. um on a national level. And Sonny is uh we've kind of given him the charter to kind of as E V P of fun. Yes. <laughs> that is that fits him perfectly. So yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. His spirit is incredible. The yeah. culture of his uh, everything he does is just it, it's got a bit of fun, but he's also make no mistake about it, he and Ray are incredible business operators along with mm -hmm. Nancy. They do an incredible job down there in Jacksonville and took the traditional real estate company and really turned the course on it and started really growing as a result of coming on board. So we love what they've done and we love having them part of the team and being able to access Ray's mind and mm -hmm. Sonny's mind and Nancy's mind. They're just fantastic people. Yeah, and um, I know a lot of the leaders of the companies that you mentioned. And um, what what do you feel is like kind of the secret sauce? I mean, they were great leaders to begin with, but how do you keep them energized? How to, you know, how have you managed to do what you've done with the growth um, and not only you know kept those leaders on board, but made them even more active and better and more successful than they already were, which was quite successful. Yeah, so we just updated our numbers and from the point of them uh, merging with us and coming on the team, whether it be a mergers, an acquisition or a tuck-in or otherwise, 
those entities have grown 27% in agent count, which is a reflection of market share. So that means we're doing something right. We haven't, there's a term of trade called when you do a deal, if you break something. And the way we don't break anything, um, we literally can say that that's an absolute term, which typically is either superlative or a hyperbole, in which case um, they're neither in this case, it's the facts. Um, is you do an extensive amount of pre due diligence. And I'm not talking about financial due diligence. You know, honestly, you could take somebody with an MBA and a finance degree and a few years, you know, working for an investment bank and do all the financial due diligence and be incredibly fulsome in your work. The difficult part is to do cultural due diligence, operational due diligence, make sure that there's a great fit because many of these deals are not all cash up front. You know, they might retain a little bit of equity or a lot of equity um, after we do the deal um, and or they have what they refer what some people refer to as earnouts or secondary payments, which are contingent upon them continuing to perform well and possibly in some cases even improving their performance. So it's really important to the seller and it's really important to us. Um, to make sure we did a boatload of due diligence, we're going to get along really well, that we're going to bring something to the table and have some fun. Um, and that is how we have kind of different outcomes than some other people that have done consolidations. There's months and months and sometimes years of getting to know each other, spending time together, you know, the, the whole cliche of breaking bread. Um, and just really getting to know each other and say, is this someone that you want to work with? And we always look to are they excited about being part of a national organization where they can materially contribute to the conversation, to the strategy and the tactics that we deploy? And we have lifted our business dramatically because these very talented CEOs and entrepreneurs are not only engaged, but very actively engaged in helping us make the company better. So a lot yeah. of work up front, right? Yeah, I, I feel like United does that especially well. I also feel like, you know, there is a focus on the transaction and then there's a focus on the relationship. It's just like a real estate transaction, right? I mean, many agents are just transactional. They, they don't worry about the relationship and then the market goes south and they're screwed. Um, so I kind of feel like you really have taken that to another level. Any advice for other brokers who are, you know, looking to grow as well um, through M&A, especially like you've done? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, anyone can do it. Um, it takes a little bit of creativity. You have to listen very carefully as to what the seller's objectives are. You know, what do they want? Are they trying to diversify their, are they trying to take a few dollars off the table? Are they trying to retire? You know, what is it that they want? What's their objective? And spend a lot of time on that because sometimes it's not a fit. You know, we can't meet their need. We can't meet the bid on those points. Forget the money. The money always works out. You know, you can always make the money work. Um, but if you're a seller and someone comes in and makes a quick offer to buy your company and they have not asked you, you know, who keeps the lights on? Who are the essential cultural people that really make this company something special? How are you special? You know, what are you, how are you different? If you're a seller, especially if you don't get all cash up front, and even if you do, because you care about the legacy and you care about the people there, you want to see the buyer do a lot of due diligence, almost to the point where it's annoying. You know, we try to be very you know, kind about it. We are very kind about it, but we get really deep into it. And anyone that comes in and makes a quick offer to buy the company, they're, direct, they're trying to window dress their performance and trying to just slam, you know, either more agents or market share or whatever. Their objective is to hit some sort of performance metric for the public markets or it's not consistent with a seller who actually cares about the business that they birthed. You know, so I think as a seller, you want to see, you want to see a very fulsome and very detailed due diligence and not just financial or legal or insurance. You want to see them asking and caring about, show me your org chart and talk to me about each of these people. I mean, every single person, what does this person do? And, you know, how impactful are they to the business? Were they here when you first started your business? What's their tenure? We get all that information. We have conversations about all of that to show it's an indication of culture and you really have to do it correctly. Otherwise, you break things.
and it, your legacy evaporates, it gets eviscerated by the post, you know, the dramatic, oh, we did, went through this big change and it wasn't handled correctly. And then you have agents leaving the door. Now, no one's happy. Employees that have been there for 15 or 20 years are not happy. We are very careful about the change management for every single human being that made that company special enough for us to be interested. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and I know that you obviously focus more on M&A. Every company has to have more than just one focus in growth. Um, and you've really shifted some to organic growth, um, you know, as opportunities. I think you took a not really a pause, but maybe or um, slowing down a little bit on your M&A and moving toward a focus on organic growth, given the market. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that strategy and how you kind of work those strategies together. Yeah, so we really have about five growth vectors that we can deploy depending on market conditions. Uh, the focus right now is principally on organic growth. So where we've made an acquisition or a partial acquisition, um, we provide tools, resources, and um, uh, encouragement, mentorship to share best practices across the organization so that each of those brokerages can grow to the best of their capabilities. And if they don't have the capabilities, we'll add capabilities to help them out by learning from each other. So right now we're focused on organic and we consider franchising part of that thrust. So franchising and the, re the, the easy way to differentiate between M&A and organic growth is if you're not writing a big check up front, it might be a small check, but if you're not writing a big check up front, that is organic growth. So someone buys a franchise and they have 1,500 agents or, or 50 agents and they buy a franchise and they become part of the, the affiliated network. Mm -hmm. That's organic growth. You know? So we have, um, we've really hunkered down and there's a book and it's become a running joke inside the business about crossing the chasm. It's kind of a 101 read that anyone that kind of spent some time really studying the best business books out there have read many, many times, but it's a good one. And it's called, how do you, how do you cross the chasm? And so we have really taken the market downturn as an opportunity to sharpen all of our processes, our SOPs, standard operating practices, so that our organic growth is happening systematically across each of our brokerages, including franchise offices, co-op op company operated offices. So the technology they use has been vastly improved in the last 12 months, and it was good before. We've mm -hmm. taken some stuff somewhat off the shelf and tuned it to our liking. Um, we have a cadence of bi-monthly. Is that right? Bi-monthly? I always get confused. Twice a month. <laughs> Twice a month, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, twi twice a month we have a national uh, recruiting call where everyone gets on and, and mm -hmm. the best recruiters in the country share how they do it and mm -hmm. what they did. I mean, we have we had a recruiter that recruited 89 people in one month wow. in one office. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to be on there and she's going to say, well, here's exactly how I do it. And they're sharing mm -hmm. it with all the franchise brokers and co-op brokers. So it's the tools, the techniques, it's the culture of cooperation and collaboration, and it's not BS. It's not just words on a wall or on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. We truly, everyone truly cares that their peer group within the recruiting, you know, function of the business. And we activated the agents and we gave them incentives to, if they want to invite great people onto the team, we activated them. So we've deployed a number of techniques in order to drive the organic growth. And paradoxically, you can buy companies cheaper today, but remember I said, we don't really, we're not really interested in a short-term pop in growth. Yeah. What we're interested in is an entrepreneur joining us and being very happy and they want to stick around. Even if they sold us 100% of their business, we still have all the entrepreneurs um, that there was, I guess, one that retired, okay? Mm -hmm. One that retired um, and one that told us when we did the deal, we've got a fully functioning team and I want to spend more time with my family. So that was mm -hmm. fully disclosed. Other than that, we have CEOs that got 100% of their stock cash. Mm -hmm. They've got it all in their hands. They made a lot of money. And they're probably having more fun than they've ever had, working and solving problems on a bigger scale. So I, I think, I think you, the ability to pivot to market condition, and paradoxically, it's a great time to buy companies, but we care about the seller outcome. So some of the conversations we're having with people, we're saying, now is not a good time to sell us your company. Mm -hmm. It's actually a great time to grow your business. Let's grow it together. And then we can have a conversation about potentially buying some of your company or all of your company down the road when the market recovers. So I know that sounds weird because we could buy them cheaper today, 
Mm-hmm. But then what? You know, five years from now or three years from now, someone says, man, I sold at the bottom of the market and they're not they're not happy. We want people to be happy, not just at the moment of the transaction, but two years later, five years later. And to that point, I hired an outside investment bank slash research firm to survey independently all of our deals we've done. Mm-hmm. And we're literally, do you trust us? A hundred percent of them said yes. Did your company grow after doing the deal? Yes. Did United do what it said it was going to do prior, you know, prior to you know striking a deal with you? Yes. A hundred percent referenceable. You can call any one of them. Mm-hmm. And they're like, these guys do what they say they're going to do. And they're honorable. We're not perfect, but we make mistakes. But, you know, they all grew um, and they're all happy. And that's what we want. That makes a good company for the long haul, not for just short term KPI driving. Yeah, I mean, it, it it suits you as well to help them build the company before you buy it, because then you're buying a, you know, I don't want to say better run because it might have been run well to begin with, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just one that maybe runs a little more to your, the way you run business. Mm. Yeah. Um, And and it's, it's interesting. Each one of them in a sometimes nuanced way. And a lot of times in very non nuanced ways have impacted the way we run our business. I mean, Mm -hmm. you can't be arrogant saying you have all the answers as, as a consolidator, yeah. You have to go into it knowing you don't know everything and that each of these entrepreneurs, even if they have a relatively small brokerage, have something to offer. They're passionate. You know, what are they curious about? And can you can you get that in, that curiosity into the company and make the company overall better? It's not lip service. It's what mm-hmm. we do. You know, and I, I've done another consolidation in another space when I was a lot younger. We spent about one hundred and eighty million dollars rolling up the mid market systems integration space for Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, I was young and I have scar tissue about all the mistakes I made because <laughs> I thought I knew all the answers. Mm-hmm. You know, I came in, I bought companies, made changes immediately and did a bunch of stuff that now that I'm a little bit older, just a little bit, I don't make those mistakes anymore because you might win in the short run, but you lose in the long run. You know, yeah. so. Well, so you've mentioned in previous interviews kind of the strategic vision and um, alignment of your leadership team. And like you said, um, you've also put a lot of those owners into national positions. I know Philip, I can't remember, what is it? EVP of strategy. Strategy, thank you. Um, And you just said Sunny is fun. Um, (laughs) So, so, you know, how did this vision evolve during the years of 2019 to 2023? And um, what role did it play in kind of navigating the challenges through those years? Because we did, we had that, it was pre-pandemic, it was pandemic, it was post-pandemic. I mean, we had a lot of different markets within those five years. Yeah, and I would drizzle in a little thing called the NAR lawsuit. Yes, um, drizzle a little that thing. in. That was, yeah. And then interest rates moving up in the fastest window ever. Yeah. Uh, just keep adding stuff, you know, those challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you with absolute assurance, had we not done those deals and gotten those leaders to augment our awesome leadership team that we've been Mm -hmm. very careful to curate, we have a relatively small team, Mm -hmm. um, we would not have navigated it with as much grace. I mean, we're up 15% in agent count year over year, July ended 2024. We're up 15% with no Mm M&A. And it's because, and all of the decisions we made, even how to approach the lawsuit and resolution of the lawsuit, which we put in the rear view mirror through Mm -hmm. settlement, all of that was further illuminated and polished and improved because of the thoughts of all that group. You know, we weren't arrogant to say we, you know, well, we know best, you know, we're, we're the mothership or whatever, like it's none of that in the culture, none. And so getting them to, you don't even have to get them to do it. You have conversations. I mean, Steve Wagner is one of, if not the best agent development per- person I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He's passionate about it. The, and I'm not, uh, look, I'm not going to throw Steve under the bus, but Steve doesn't have to work. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't have to work before he allowed us to invest <laughs> in his business. Yeah. You know, notice the nuance of what I just said. That wasn't, mm-hmm. that wasn't, I just caught myself doing it. Mm-hmm. He allowed us to invest in his business, Mm -hmm. but he was super passionate and wanted to be part of a national company so that he could take his agent development training and put it in our learning management system, our LMS, develop Mm -hmm. new courses to have 
to, for, so that we could improve how we can train and help agents to become their best selves. Um, Philip, what he's doing from an EVP perspective, what Eric's doing on the lead program from, with, with Zillow and other companies, his lead conversion processes are exemplary. You know, what Ray and those guys did with their lead program and what, how they, they actually showed us how to take a traditional model with a 70-30 split and royalties going off to some far off company. He, they actually showed us how to convert that model to a flat fee model and reverse a five year trend of losing agents. Hmm. Now they're growing like a weed. So it, it's, um, you have to truly be deferent and care and respect them. And it's, it's, it's legit. You know, I, when I'm when I'm in doubt or I'm trying to go arrive at a, at a good answer on whatever it is, or I just want to bounce something around, I have 10 people I can call and they're mm -hmm. it's incredible the insight that you get from them. It's a huge benefit to us as a company. It's a huge competitive advantage. We know Philip will be very honest. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk to you about the settlement a little bit, just in that, yeah. you know, what are you hearing from the offices and, and agents about it's, it's really early, but like just navigating the new waters, um, has it been pretty, I don't want to say easy, but maybe smooth, um, sailing or, you know, do you feel like people are, are accepting and looking for opportunity? Yeah, I mean, many of our people actually have been around long enough. So they mm -hmm. remember when the DOJ initially split just the sell to buy side, right? That, yeah. Remember that whole thing? That's yeah. ironic because now we're kind of mm -hmm. having the second conversation yes. years and years later. But many of our people in, and have been through massive industry changes in processes or requirements or regulate regulatory environment. So this is another one and it requires a lot of training. So we we've been training for a year. You know, we've been giving our arming our brokers with, you know, is the best information available at the moment. Um, as far as navigating the actual resolution of the matter, that was, um, to be blunt, was done at my desk. Um, you know, because of the nature of it, you know, our offices, we wrote, we write the check, not them. And so because NAR didn't get us out, uh, you know, anyone over two billion, we had to go fend for ourselves. And so that's, that's just you know, part of, yeah, it's kind of interesting because we grew to being that big during a window that if you, if you had measured it like three years earlier, we'd have been yeah. out, you know, <laughs> but, but it was great. It was a good, it was the way we navigated the, the resolution of, of the, the matter. It's a settlement, the way we handled it, the way it wasn't a distraction, the way we've systematically trained our agents, our brokers, and the way we've been collaborative internally has really positioned us quite well. And, we're continuing to to watch and and identify best practices to make sure that we're not only in the in the in the spirit not only in the letter of what's agreed to as far as changing practices but the spirit of the agreement because you know if you think about it with a flat fee model we have mm -hmm. little or no incentive whether the commission is 20% or the commission is 0% yeah we were in a unique situation we were big um but we really had no economic incentive to, mm -hmm. you know, because our, our agents pay a flat fee. Right. But that didn't matter. Yeah. Right. That, that doesn't matter. So but I think what we what we found and we just got back from a hundred person leadership uh, mm -hmm. event down in Texas mm -hmm. where it was one of the topics, but not the only topic. Mm -hmm. You know, we were not distracted by it. We said, hey, here's here's the state of play. Here's here's what the states are requiring. It's a bit confusing from state mm -hmm. to state. Yep. But I think we are we've approached it correctly. We'll probably make additional modifications as we go and we see what's working, what's not working. But I think in the end, the dust is going to settle and the market is going to speak and buyers are going to say, I'm willing to pay not, you know, I'm willing to pay this. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to pay it this way. And as that dust settles, I think we're in a very, very good position um, and we're already benefiting greatly, actually, from it as mm -hmm. people are exiting more traditional splits with royalties mm -hmm. and trying to find a platform where they can keep more of what they earn as there may or may not be compression on how much commission or compensation they earn in the transaction. So we'll see. But yeah. right now it's 
going quite well, Tracy. Yeah, I think it definitely will evolve, um, you know, as we go. And as people, as agents get better at having those conversations with both sellers and buyers um, as Mm -hmm. well. So um, what do you see as maybe some of the top trends moving into the next year in the real estate industry in general? Well, I think you're going to see a continuation, you know, after, and this is true in any industry, not just real estate, after you see a compression of an industry, you see some folks who are what I would almost consider in no man's land, where they have a certain cost structure, but they don't have enough scale. And when the volume comes off the top, they start getting into their fixed cost and they're bouncing along negative margins. And so you're seeing quite a few people who are saying, God, I really love the business and I want to stay in it. And I've got a 50 agents or 100 agents, but I'm just not big enough and I don't see the light to be able to get big enough. So I can join United, um, give all my agents a great place, great tools, deburden myself from some of the uh, responsibilities and cost of being an independent brokerage. And I can still maintain my economic upside of having built this team. So we're seeing increasing. I think that trend's going to continue. And, you know, there's two types of people that are approaching us and they're approaching us all over the country. One is it's a falling knife. They are in a downward spiral. You know, they've got cost structure that's kind of messed up. And there is a place for them here, but it's a different type of thing. We definitely handle it fairly and carefully. And they just need a place to kind of resurrect their team or their brokerage within a brokerage who can deburden them from a lot of SGNA cost or risk or liability or whatever it is. And then there's another one where they're on the incline, but they see the kit we put together, you know, the technology, the cost of getting access to that is de minimis. So they're they're wanting to join for the same reasons because they see a changed market and they want to have a high they want to increase their prospects of having success for their agents and for them. And so either one is perfectly great with us. And we're, we're welcoming teams of 60, 80, 40, all over the country. And we're seeing an increasing number of, of calls coming in saying, we know that your system doesn't economically burden our agents or me, so can I join? And then I'll work off all of my cost, whether it be a lease or otherwise, and but I can still maintain my business operations as a team within your brokerage. And so we're like, yeah, great, let's do it. And then individual agents that are migrating as well. Yeah. And um, my last question is just what's next as far as growth for United, um, you know, based on your predictions of the market moving maybe into the next year. And we've also got an election, um, which may impact that as well. So yeah. what are what are some of the strategies that you're looking at? Or what are some of your predictions for the market moving forward that really impact your company specifically? Yeah, so two things, well, a few things, it won't just be two. Um, <laughs> I just smile and laugh because you know, me. one is, uh, we're not playing for the short run. Mm-hmm. You know, so as much as it's hard, if you have, you know, your finances in order, then you view these windows of opportunity, this, you know, leading through ambiguity, there's another side to that, which is through incredible intense opportunity. There's never been more opportunity uh, for those that are ready for it and have the right models and that actually got ready for this moment. Cause you knew the market was going to adjust at some point. We just didn't know it adjust this dramatically. Right. So I think, I think you're, you know, this is my fourth go around with the general national election and every single time it freezes the market, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless if you're on the right or left, um, you know, we're, we're an apolitical organization, Mm -hmm. right or left, people are emotionally charged because they're seeing, uh, you know, the world's going to end depending on your perspective. It depends on what commercial says the world's going to end. Um, so people freeze in place, you know, it's one of a natural reaction by a human being. And then they realize after the election, regardless of how much drama, oh, world, my life continues to go forward. So I need to move forward with my move. I need to move mm-hmm. forward with that investment, blah, 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 blah. So it's going to freeze a bit, right? We're, we're expecting that and it's, it's whatever. Um, and then after it'll release and it's going to release for a number of reasons. And we don't know if it's going to be in Q1 or Q2, but you're going to see some modest release, but year over year, it's going to be fairly impressive because there's so much pent up demand that's sitting there. Life happened to a lot of people and they deferred their sale or they deferred their purchase. And that's just, that's just in the data. You know, it's a rubber band, you know, the, the regression line 
over decades is a rubber band and interest rates or the anticipation of interest rates moving up or down or elections will per temporarily pull on the rubber band, but the slope of the curve is essentially the same. And it, the only thing, not to get too high school math on us, but the only thing that has a close R squared, which is about fit to the curve and the squaring of it allows you to normalize the pluses and minuses off of the regression curve. The only thing that really, um, that is population mm -hmm. and population in the United States continues to grow population mm -hmm. in certain regions of the, of the country. This is not true in every local market. Yeah. Migration is great, greater than, than people moving out. Mm -hmm. um, migration in is greater and births are greater than deaths still in the United States, barely, but mm -hmm. you know, we're not Italy. Yeah. which is negative yeah. versus greater than that, versus or less mm -hmm. than us. So we, in the United States, there will be plus or minus 6 million homes sold with this population. Um, it depend, depends on when we get there. You know, yeah. we're getting pulled up and down off the regression curve. The rubber band will adjust and we'll be fine. If you're playing for the long run, if you're playing for the short run, you better, you know, just keep the, ha the, batch of, the hatches battened down. Yeah, because it's going to be a bit bumpy before it's not, Yeah, you know, so again, it depends on your perspective. If you're in it for short term, quick money, if you're in it for if your balance sheet is depleted, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have to take steps to to bolster that to make it through the, the bumpiness as we kind of emerge out of this and get into the next real estate cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Dan, thanks so much for joining Real Trending. April had told me you were going to bring props, and I didn't see any props, so uh -oh. I am a little disappointed about that. But okay, hold on, hold on. I, I, every time we do a deal, every time we do a deal to celebrate and reward the team, we do these things. They used to call them tombstones. Okay. And now they. Uh, this is all the deals we've done. Now we 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 call them uh, uh, deal toys. Okay. So these acrylics. So I was going to, when you were talking about m and I was going to go, yeah. And so the team, when they do it, we have a team of like literally 30 people that all do their part and they do a great job. They're highly trained. Everyone gets a deal toy to put on their desk to say, that's what I did with hundreds of hours of my time and so that everyone can celebrate. So anyway, I would, that's my prop. That's oh, great. That and my, my Zeus and Superman. <laughs> yes. That's, yeah. that's a cool, a cool picture. Yeah, it's a local, local artist, local artist. Really? Yeah. Well, local where? Because I know you're in different cities. So yeah, good, good point. <laughs> I um, I'm in the house in Kansas City. Okay. Um, okay. and so I went to one of those. Uh, we work. It wasn't we work. It was in, like a knockoff yeah. of we work. And there was they were showing local artists on the wall, and I fell in love with this one. It's myth and mythology. Yeah. Modern religion versus. Yeah. You know, it's a. I liked it. It spoke to me. Art yeah. is a very personal thing. Some people Absolutely. are going to watch this are going to go, that's heinous. <laughs> it's Superman, you know, yeah. and Zeus. Yeah. You know, two different yeah. mythological, you know, people over time. Yeah. So it's a long story. I love it. Well, it is yeah. always a pleasure to talk to you, Dan. Thanks so much. This is great. And hey, for everybody out there, hang in there. We're all kicking butt. All boats rise. And let's have some fun in 2025. Absolutely. Absolutely.